So hi, it's John Tobin from Melbourne Law School. Before I start the conversation, I think it's really important to acknowledge, of course, that First Nations perspectives offer really rich, and I think unexplored ways of seeing, doing, and knowing the world in which we live. That's the focus of my work. First, the state of play. What is the current, I suppose, understanding of children's rights as a theory or rights-based approach as a theoretical tool for analysis? And I think there's sort of two broad schools in this space. One is that children's rights remain under-theorized. And a good, good example of that is the work of Matthias Arce in 2015, where he talks about the need to mature human rights scholarship, the need to ground a critical theoretical agenda in ideas around interdisciplinarity, citizenship, and anti-discrimination law. On the other hand, there are scholars such as Hansen and Pallig in a recent article in 2020 that say, in fact, there's actually an abundance of theories we have to start doing now is thinking more about how those theories intersect. And they suggest a need to reflect on, for example, the moral foundations of children's rights and take into account issues around intersectionality and the impact of globalization. So the point I suppose to stress here, there's now a growing body of law and this conversation and scholarship around the idea of the theoretical foundation of children's rights and a rights-based approach. But there's still work to be done. So when you're talking about a rights-based approach as a theoretical tool, the first question, I suppose, is, well, should, in fact, children have rights or do they have rights? And there's three broad points I'd like to make here. First, we went back to the 60s and 70s. The conversation there was around the idea of child liberation. So scholars such as Holt and Farson were very much of the opinion that child was an oppressive social construction that was really harmful to children, and children should enjoy rights in the same way that adults did. That conversation came in the context of a really broad commitment to rights in the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement as well. As we moved out of the 70s into the 80s, we saw advocates taking a more balanced and perhaps more nuanced approach to children, recognizing the vulnerability. So scholars like Freeman, Ekla, and Achard, Achard talked about the importance of children's rights, but the fact that children's rights were somehow often understood differently to adults' rights because of their vulnerability. Alongside that commitment to rights from advocates like Freeman, Eckler and Archard, we saw, of course, a growing skepticism of the relevance of rights for children. Now, importantly, that skepticism applies to all types of rights and continues to this day. But in fact, in the context to children, there are sp some specific concerns that are important to highlight. So the first, this is the capacity deficit. So for many scholars like Purdy or Griffin, capacity to exercise rights is a prerequisite for the enjoyment of those rights. And children, they would claim are too young and therefore can't have rights. Others, like Marty Guggenheim, the idea of children being rights bearers becomes a threat to the family, undermines parental rights. Or in fact, the reality is that children aren't oppressed and remain dependent on parents. So therefore, rights aren't helpful and in fact can be done. Critique. Again, something that applies across the entire human rights enterprise. But in terms of children, as identified with the works of people like Pooperback, talks about the inappropriate conception of childhood under the Convention on the Rights of the Child that doesn't take into account the experience of children in the global South. And finally, it's important to be aware that there are other emancipatory discourses as well that may in fact be more appropriate for children, ethics of care, obligation-based perspectives, et cetera. But if children are to have rights, which rights should they enjoy? And again, it's important to stress there are different perspectives here. So we go back to John Eckler's work in the 1980s. He talked about there being three types of interests that ground children's rights. Children's basic interests, their developmental interests, and their autonomy interests. Michael Freeman talked about four types of interests that grounded rights. Welfare, protection, justice, and freedom interests were the foundation for children having rights. There are other and more broader conversations around what rights children should have derived from things like a child-centered approach, a critical race theory, or a social ecological model. Again, the point to make here is be aware that in fact, there are different arguments around which rights children should have. So what about the model I tend to use? Well, I'm a lawyer by training, so it's unsurprising that I suppose I tend to rely on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There's a really important question about should in fact the Convention be the foundation of a rights-based approach? Is it legitimate? Now, for someone like Archer, the answer, of course, would be yes. It's the unavoidable contemporary context for thinking about the status of children. But for others, there's more concern. For example, Matthias Archer talks about the legitimacy deficit 
that underpins the convention. This instrument was written for children, but not by children. So to an extent then does in fact reflect the interests of children, given they didn't have the capacity to identify and articulate for their own rights during the drafting of that document. Other groups, there's an action argument that we should dismantle and reconstruct the convention. This has been made by a body called the Reconstructing Child Rights Institute, which has concerns about the way in which rights and the convention has been used in humanitarian contexts in an overly protectionist way. And they've got Carl Hansen, a leading scholar in the field, who talks about the need to reinvent children's rights, such as his concern with the current understanding and misuse of rights. So where am I taking today? Well, my argument is I'm not prepared to dismantle, deconstruct and reinvent rights. Rather, I in fact, try to encourage you to discover rights as they exist under the convention and discover what it means to adopt a rights-based approach as a theoretical tool. For me, looking at the convention over the past 25 years, I continue to discover that it's richer, more nuanced than I suppose many people would often recognize. This involves engaging closely with the text to in fact discover and identify the underlying theoretical foundations that inform the standards and norms which are adopted by states and understood by practitioners, policymakers, and activists in practice. Before I sort of outline that model, I think it's really important to see how we can distinguish a rights-based approach from the other dominant approaches that inform our conceptualization of childhood. So the three broad models here, one is a property-based conception of childhood, the second is a welfare-based conception, and of course, the third is a rights-based approach. So a property-based conception of childhood really is pretty simple in that children are seen as being the property of their parents. And this in fact was what the law and society affirmed for centuries, okay? Both in the courts, in the laws, we saw children as being merely an extension of the interests and rights and entitlements of the parents and more specifically of fathers. The doctrine of patria protestus, which many you have heard of as well. Now we don't see that idea or conception of childhood necessarily in legislation anymore but for me we see the legacy of that conception in many social practices to give you an example corporal punishment i think reflects this understanding that in fact parents do have some proprietary interest in their children and therefore can treat them in ways that wouldn't be tolerable for any other person within society so i can't hit my partner i can't hit my students i can't hit you but I can hit each of my four children every day of the week in the name of providing them with reasonable chastisement. I think that's deeply problematic for a whole range of reasons, but I do think the fact that societies like my own tolerates this approach reflects the impact in enduring legacy of a propriety-based conception of childhood. What about a welfare-based approach? Well, we saw a shift from a property-based approach to a welfare-based approach around the turn of the 20th century, where there's an understanding driven by a whole range of factors humanitarian organizations, religious organizations, that in fact, the home wasn't always a safe place. There was a need for society to take measures to protect children and in fact, recognize their best interests. So the recalibration of the way which society thought about children to raise their interests as having been separate from theirs or their parents and requiring the state to take measures to intervene to protect those in certain circumstances. Very much embedded in paternalism, okay? And of course, the best interest principle is what captures and reflects that particular practice. So the benevolence was well intended, but it often had a dark side. Clearly the most obvious example of that in my own country is the stolen generation, whereby legislation was enacted to allow for the removal of indigenous children from their parents on the basis that it was in their best interest to do so. Deeply racist, deeply problematic, has created intergenerational trauma in ways that we could never have imagined, but again, all based around this concept of the welfare principle. And I should add that in fact, we are still removing children from the care of indigenous parents at rates that should never be tolerated. We move then from a welfare-based approach to a rights-based approach. And this sort of starts to take place throughout the eighties and the nineties. We certainly haven't had a complete shift this approach here, but we're elevating children's interests now to the status of rights that generate obligations and claims that should be enforced and recognized within society as well. So we're gonna explore in more detail what that rights-based approach looks like, but it's important to recognize its distinguishing characteristics from both a property-based approach or a welfare-based approach. So let's think then about the convention and what sort of vision of rights it offers for children and how it might underpin some. Point one is to recognize that the convention is what's called an incompletely theorized agreement. This is an idea that's, I suppose, developed by Cass Sunstein, a US scholar, 
And essentially it says that when it comes to negotiating legislation, often we can't get agreement on the uh, foundations of a particular issue uh, and how we resolve that. So we have this incompletely theorized agreement. So we have levels of abstraction. So when it comes to the convention, if you look at the text of that, this is an example of an incompletely theorized agreement. In a space where we've got obviously a vast range of cultural and social practices, there wasn't ever going to be agreement on the really specific foundations of certain entitlements and rights under the convention. So we accept and have consensus on much more abstract, incompletely theorized entitlements for children. That's an important point. It's important because we'll see later on, that means there's scope to create a dynamic and evolving understanding of rights. They're not fixed, they're not static. The second point is when it comes to human rights, there's, I suppose, now an accepted position with amongst most scholars that there's an overlapping consensus that rights are grounded in dignity. This, of course, is another contentious concept, much scholarship around what dignity looks like. But for our purposes, it's as simple to think about it as being this, that every individual okay, has value by virtue of their humanity. That very much Kantian concept of dignity as well. Then the question becomes, well, if we are to realize dignity, what are the interests required to live a life of dignity? I say, so the ground rights of dignity and the convention provides those interests that each child should have and enjoy in order to ensure they live a life of dignity. Yes, we can discuss that because it's contentious, but that's, I suppose, the sort of broad starting point. The third point I think is really important is when it comes to rights, they're grounded in interests, okay? Very important, as opposed to what we call a will theory of rights. There's two competing conceptions of rights. A will theory, where rights are grounded and tied to capacity to exercise rights, that classic libertarian model you'd see in American scholarship. And we have an interest theory, which really, I suppose, is the idea that rights are grounded in certain interests. The question becomes, which interests become rights? But people like Raz and in the context of children, McCormack really adopt that approach approach. And so in the convention, when it comes to worrying about grounding rights in capacity and the need to enjoy certain interests to secure that life of dignity, a relational theory of rights in the convention, as opposed to an atomistic or individualized conception of rights. This is a really important point. So when it comes to rights, many scholars, when it comes to children, worry about the focus on the autonomy of the discrete, atomistic, individualized uh, individual or person. So certainly feminist scholarship has shown us that, in fact, the world doesn't work like that. And we are much more interdependent. We are much more relational. So when we look at the text of the convention, it also reflects a relational conception of rights, i.e. children's rights are understood and enjoyed in relation with and in relation to the rights of their community, of their parents, of their family. That's an important point. And we can explore that as well. So those things are really important to come back to how people maybe, maybe misunderstand the idea of rights-based approach. So what's all this mean then? So what does this interest theory produce for children? And you'll see, I think, in the slide here, a whole range of really broad entitlements or rights or interests that children now enjoy under the convention. And we talk about the three Ps, protection rights, provision rights, and participation rights. That's a little bit, I think, um, overly simplistic, but it's one way of just recognizing the very broad scope and the very vast range of interests that are recognized as being integral to provide children with a life of dignity. But importantly, this is where a rights-based approach differs from other theories is we have explicit obligations imposed on duty bearers, okay? So you'll see in Article 4, it's quite expansive understanding of the obligations of states to undertake all appropriate measures, okay, to ensure that children enjoy their rights under the convention. Even talking about the way we must allocate resources to secure those rights as well. But also be mindful that the convention talks about the rights and duties of parents as they exist in relation to children as well. So we've got this quite complex situation whereby the convention defines the relationships between children, their parents, and the state. And it sets out the normative foundations and values and standards that are supposed to inform those relationships. So let's closely look at the text of the convention to rediscover rather than reinvent a rights-based approach. So just quickly, Article 3 talks about the child's best interests. Now, this is sometimes seen as being merely a restatement of the welfare principle. The important point to note here, in fact, of course, is that 
when we understand Article 3 in a child's best interests, that must also be informed by all the other interests that are identified as rights within the convention. Importantly for us here, Article 12 is one of those interests. So we're looking to assess a child's best interest, we must also engage with a practice and procedure that allows us to understand the views of the child, which may in fact become determinative of those best interests. The second point here is it's a primary consideration. So it's recognition of the balancing between a child's interests and other interests within society, other children, other adults, health, but there's a balancing here, a recalibration, okay? And I ask yourself this question here, we think about this as being a welfareist paternalist principle, but in fact, should it not be the case that in all matters concerning everyone, that our best interests are taken into account by policymakers and legislators. Let's go to Article 5, which I think is often overlooked, in fact, neglected would be how I describe it, um, when it comes to that relation between parents, children and state. So here is the obligation that states must respect the rights, duties and responsibilities of parents. So this sort of addresses that concern of people like Guggenheim. There's an obligation for the state to recognise the important role parents play, and in fact, the broader community and local customs. So we're identifying cultural practices here. But this is the shift that takes place. That respect and those duties and responsibilities that parents and members of a broader community enjoy must be exercised in a manner that's consistent with the involving capacities of the child, first point. And second point, that they must be providing appropriate direction and guidance for a child to enjoy his, her, or their rights. Not controlling, scaffolding, supporting children move to the point where they, in fact, can act independently. So we've got dependence, we've got interdependence, and we've got independence taking place in terms of how we think about a child's relationship with their parents and broader community. So it's not explicitly paternalistic, nor is it sort of explicitly um, favouring absolute autonomy as well, it's this really graduated balancing act that takes place. Now we can discuss whether that's justified or not, but I think it's important to recognise this is a complex idea, which in fact reflects for me what we might describe as a fiduciary type relationship between parents and their children. So you think of a proprietary based conception, I as a father own my children, not under this model. No, I as a father have certain responsibilities to essentially scaffold, guard, support, enable my children to have the capacity to enjoy their rights autonomously over time, subject to the evolving capacities as well. Article 12, everyone knows about this, but important point to make here is we must read this in the context of all the other rights that exist under the convention. We overlook that all the time. We don't use a rights-based approach to children's voice. It's a critical part of it, but it's not the only part of it, okay? And in fact, if you read Matthias Arce's piece, he makes this point uh, very well about the need to include all the other participatory rights exist under the convention around freedom of expression, freedom of association. Having said that, it's again important to see what's taking place in this model, the values that are being used to inform, shall assure a positive duty to take measures to enable children to actually express their views. We're developing child-friendly procedures to enable, to scaffold, to support children's ability to express their views. That is not what we see under a welfareist approach, not what we see under a property-based approach. Okay, in terms of the ability to express those views in all matters affecting the child. Okay, that's obviously very broad and expansive. And then, of course, this idea about due weight being given in accordance with age and maturity of the child as well. And of course, the question here is, will the age, uh, well, sorry, will the views of the child ever be determinative? There's a tendency to read Article 12 as saying, no, 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 there's this residual power that adults have to say, we can step in and always make decisions about what we think will be best for you. I disagree. I think if you have a proper, coherent interpretation of the convention and you have a coherent understanding of the idea of children's rights, then... The minute a child reaches the capacity that would be required of an adult to exercise autonomy, there is no role for the state. For me, that is foundational to a theory of rights that is justified when it comes to children having special rights. And again, I've written on this in other papers, which um, we can attach for you to read, but this provision is often read, I think, in ways that don't reflect what I call a coherent or internally coherent interpretation of the convention. Article 12 
okay, if we are to give special rights to children, must anticipate that at a certain point of time, those children will be autonomous, even if we don't agree with what they want. That's con that's really contentious, right? That's going to create debates within families and hospitals and schools. But I think a genuine rights-based approach anticipates that possibility that a child who has capacity equivalent to an adult has then the right to exercise autonomy. So let's then try and wrap this conversation up a little bit in terms of what does a rights-based approach do for the conception of the child? So you'll hopefully see in a slide here that under a welfare-based approach, we see a very passive child defined very much by their lack of capacity, their vulnerability, and the need for protection, a lack of expertise. They're silenced, seen, but not heard. This is a deficit-based approach. It's a model or a theory based around children's inability to do things for themselves. They are minors. And I hate that phrase. They're not minors. They're children, young people, they're human beings. They're not minors, okay? A rights-based approach says we recognize that children are vulnerable, but in the same way that adults are vulnerable, okay? Remember, vulnerability is not peculiar to childhood. Very important point. A rights-based approach says we recognize vulnerabilities exist, but we also see all the strengths that children possess. They're more than victims, potential agents, collaborators, survivors. Yes, protection may be necessary, but we move from substitute decision-making to supported and then eventually to independent decision-making. It's an evolving theory of enabling autonomy to take place. Children have capacity resilience. Yes, there's interdependence with adults, but there's also independence from adults. They have expertise, okay? And they must be active participants in all matters that affect them. Seen, heard, listened to, and taken seriously. That's a deeply different theoretical understanding of what we should be doing when it comes to a welfare-based approach or a role property-based approach where these conversations weren't even discussed. It's a strength-based focus. We're seeing children through a different lens than we would under a welfare-based approach. This is really challenging because we're all acculturated as adults to see we move from childhood to adulthood and that transforms us in some ways, okay? No, um, children and young people also have enormous capacities as well. We have to start seeing those, engaging with those and supporting those as well. So a really good example then of how we compare and contrast this approach is with the Committee on the Rights of the Child's general comment on children in street situations. And hopefully the slides in front of you, and I've highlighted some really important points, which try and summarise some of the key differences between the various approaches. A child rights approach is whether the child's respect as a rights holder and decisions are often made by the child. A welfare approach involves rescuing. It's that victimhood mentality where children have are objects that we can save, okay? That classic sort of benevolence, it's a positive thing that will care, but if it's exercised in the wrong way, it can in fact be harmful as well. In this context here, we don't think about children's views. They don't know. We don't know what's best than we do. And of course, there's also what we talk about as being a repressive approach, or we might call a law and order approach, where the child is delinquent, okay? And we're thinking about punishing that child. They're a threat to us as well, which we haven't really talked about. It's another approach that certainly informs youth justice type models as well, but also our understanding of children in street situations. So that's obviously a very simplistic summary, but it's starting to get us to rethink how we see the child. And once we start rethinking how we see the child as a rights holder, there are consequences that flow from what we then do as well. So it, of course, transforms the way in which we do research. So under a classic welfare model, the child is the object of inquiry. We research on the child. The child is not part of a research question. The methodology of evaluation, they're certainly seen, but rarely heard. Under a rights-based approach, our model shifts. The child's a subject. We should be undertaking research with children. They have a potential role in designing the research question, the methodology of evaluation and dissemination. They're seen, heard, and actively involved, okay? So the work of Lundy and McAvoy is really, I think, important and seminal in this space as well. But it's, again, shifting the way we think about how we do research from what we've done historically as well. So let's try and bring this together and sum up a little bit as well. I've tried to cover a lot pretty quickly. So what does a rights-based approach mean for the study of children as a theoretical framework? Well, if we think about children as a rights bearer and as implications and about how we frame the very issue we are undertaking consideration of, okay? So a really simple example would be, what about a child who's born with variations in their sex characteristics? 
under a welfare or under a medical model, we might say they're not normal. We've got to fix them. We'll intervene at birth to rectify their deformity or their abnormality and we'll make them into a normal boy or girl. And that's driven by a general concern about what we see is the experience of that child when they grow into adolescence. But is that in fact the right way of going about things? Because we think about that child who's born with that variation in sex characteristics, they've got rights, yeah? So do we need to intervene at birth to determine their physical appearance? Or do we need to think about how we defer decisions like that until such a time as the child, he, her, or themselves has the capacity to express their views about how they want to live their life and what sort of body they want to have. So in a rights-based approach, we say we should be deferring that decision-making to such point in time as the child can make decisions for themselves. That's gonna challenge dominant practices. It's gonna challenge what parents might want to enjoy, but doctors' views about what a child's best interests are, it's on recognizing the implications of seeing that child as a rights holder. So it shifts the focus dramatically in terms of we see them and then how we do as well. So how we frame the issue. And once we frame the issue, we see those rights and we think, well, what's the right in question here? What's the scope of the interest and what's the nature of the duty bearer? There's a whole lot of complex jurisprudence around that as well, which again is informed by different theories about how we understand things like the right to health or the right to privacy. And then importantly as well, what a rights-based approach does for us, it gives us a technique to balance and restrict rights in certain circumstances as well. So rights aren't absolute. So we have this sort of accepted methodology within international law or human rights law that when we seek to restrict the rights, we've got to make sure that, that that method is legal, that it pursues a legitimate social interest and those we adopt are both suitable and necessary. So this is quite rigorous demanding exercise that says, that if I have a right then, and you want to take it away as a child, then you must demonstrate. You have bear the burden as a state because the right is mine to hold as a child and the state or any other group wants to undermine it, then they must justify it for rigorous reasons. And the final point, which I've already made, is this idea that in fact, a rights-based approach also informs the methodology we adopt for research and how we disseminate our outcomes as well. So in the materials and the references you'll see, quite a few examples of this, but you know, I just wanna highlight a couple here. One is the rewriting children's rights judgments, which uh, Helen Stolford and um, Catherine Hollingsworth put together a wonderful edited collection here. And this is a classic example for me of whereby when we take a rights-based prism, okay, and all its key components, and we put it in terms of the gaze over a case, we see something quite different to what might've been seen if we adopted that classic welfareist approach. And that exercise of rewriting children's rights judgments is exactly that. It's about saying, how can we demonstrate the impact of a rights-based analysis as a theoretical framework? It shifts things. It changes things. We see things differently. In the same way that feminist critiques, okay, or critical race critiques will reveal different things, different ways of knowing, seeing, and doing. And then I'm gonna to plug two of my own students' work because they've done the same sort of thing in their own publications and their own PhDs. So one here you see from Rosika J. Saria talks about this really troubling trend around um, temporary labor migration. Invariably mothers leaving children to work in other parts of the world and provide remittances. The assumption is, well, that's great. You get some money, send it back home. But no one, no one has said, what about the impact of that practice on children and their right to a family and their right to be cared for and know their parents? So Rosika says, we've got to recalibrate that significant global phenomenon to start thinking about the impact of this on children and their rights. And then um, Georgina Demopoulos has recently published a really important book around digital privacy and the rights of the child. And she's basically saying, when it comes to issues around decision-making, we have to start informing that process through child rights principles as well. And she uses the example of trans youth to essentially highlight the deficiencies in the way in which the Family Court of Australia has undertaken its reasoning to decide whether in fact a child who wants to affirm their gender identity can in fact do so without parental consent. And her argument here is that in too many cases, we are reverting to welfarist type principles to say that adults, we know it's best for children 
even in circumstances where children demonstrate complete autonomy, understanding of what will happen to them and why they want to do it. And that undermines, again, their decisional privacy rights, but also their right to identity as well. So some really important examples emerging now where we're seeing a rights-based approach used as a theoretical tool to recalibrate the way in which adults, policymakers, legislators, activists have understood children and their experiences as well. So let's then finish now with some of the challenges that remain. So as a theory, I still think terribly misused and unbelievably misunderstood. So when it comes to how it's misused, those who are adopting a rights-based approach tend to often focus exclusively on the idea of children's voice. Yes, it's fundamental. Yes, it's critical, but it's only one part of a much more elaborate set of interests that exist and must be forming part of that conversation around the systems, the structures, locally, internationally, that generate the conditions that lead to interferences with children's rights. The second point is we often reduce it to very legalistic approaches as well, which is Matthias Arce's concern as well. It's not just about the implementation of the convention. I want to go beyond that to, under, to identify the underlying values and theories that shape those standards and how they intersect with each other as well. The other point is that we often misinterpret the ideas, values and norms in the convention as well. So a, a really simple example is child marriage. There's a really strong push to ban that in all circumstances. Now that makes sense. I don't want my kids getting married before they're 18. But hang on a second, if we're actually adopting a coherent approach to the issue of child marriage, we must anticipate the possibility that in some contexts, a child under age 18 may have the capacity to consent to marriage. Now that's confronting possibly, but a coherent rights-based approach anticipates that possibility. Doesn't demand that will always happen, but it doesn't discount the possibility as well. And particularly in certain cultural contexts and social contexts, it may be a very valid choice for a child to make, although not always in the circumstances of their own choosing. So some misapplications that take place. And then on the issue of being misunderstood. So those who don't even think that rights are worth thinking about, I think are often informed by um, a failure to discover what the convention actually offers. So rights and centers being individualistic. Well, yes. A child enjoys those rights, but they enjoy them in relation to others. First point. Rights are simply normative, okay? They're the, the, uh, the ends we're seeking to achieve. Yes, but they're also instrumental. They provide us with an insight into the process we should be adopting to address and resolve issues concerning children. Rights are simply Western constructs, far too simplistic. If you read the text of the convention, you can see the efforts being made to accommodate and recognize the importance of culture, first point. Second point is, if it's an incompletely theorized agreement, then the scope for reinterpretation is vast. The ability to vernacularize texts in ways that actually align with cultural practices is certainly ever present and should hopefully become more so the case in the future. There are constraints, okay, for sure. But this idea that it's just a West conception of childhood is really, I think, unbelievably simplistic. Fourth, rights destroy families. No, they don't. They recalibrate relationships within power, uh, families. Yes, they reallocate power, but they actually, in the convention itself, repeatedly stresses the importance of family. And importantly, it isn't a particular form of family. It isn't the heterosexual couple behind the white picket fence. It's the family as defined and understood through the lens and experience of a child. Same sex, okay, community structures, single parent, all those possibilities are in fact legitimate. Rights um, are constructed by adults, okay, and therefore they have no relevance to children. Again, misreads the text. Article three, best interests, article 12, voice and views. The convention invites, enables and requires children to become active participants in defining their, their interests that require protection as rights. Misunderstood overlooked. Rights legitimize paternalism, okay? Um, no, they allow it in some circumstances, but they do also demand recognition of evolving capacities, okay? So rights aren't simply a paternalistic discourse at all, okay? Nor are they simply abandoning children's autonomy. It's this balancing act, which is informed by children's views and relevant evidence as well. So what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done still to better understood what it means to think about a rights-based approach as a theoretical tool. But I think there's really exciting scope to use this tool 
as a way that offers new ways of seeing and knowing the world and the experience of children in that world. It's deeply concerned with power. This is why many adults don't like it, okay? This is why many politicians don't like it. My parents don't like it. Sometimes I don't like it, okay? It's like, damn, I've got to listen to what they want to say and I don't want to do that right now. But a rights-based approach is about doing just that. It outlines the values, the norms, and the processes to recalibrate and rebalance power in ways and enable children to live that life of dignity that is the foundation of a rights-based approach. And so in finishing up, I think it's important, again, that you don't listen to me, but you listen to the words of young people themselves. And so we see, even in the situation of how we develop policies, the committing the rights of the child, engaging with consultation with children who live on the street, and you see what they're saying, they want for them to be respected as human beings. It's not about giving us off the street and into shelters. It's about giving us a status. It's about giving us a status, okay? Recognizing us as being beings, not becomings. We don't want help, charity, pity. Government should work with the community to give us our rights, give us the opportunity to change our story. And that's, I think, the crux of it, isn't it, right? So when we think about a rights-based approach as a theoretical tool, it's about how to empower a group that by and large is marginalised. The science is dispossessed of a whole range of opportunities in society to allow them to exercise the autonomy, okay, the agency that allows them to have a life of dignity, okay, and doesn't require dependency simply on adults. With that, I'll close. Thank you for listening. I look forward to further conversations.